<laughs> you had mono? I don't know if I should re yeah, reveal that, but they said I did, but I got out of school for like six weeks. Wow. So oh, you were a yeah. six you were a six weeker. I guess, oh, yeah. I w mono was the big thing when we were growing up, and it was like yeah. it, a kid would be missing either, either kidnapped by aliens or they had mono. It was one of the two yeah. things. Yeah. So, you yeah, didn't well, feel I, much, but you just didn't have to go to school. I don't, I don't remember all, all the details. I just remember. Yes, it was old school COVID. <laughs> was, yeah, was a, exactly. You had to be put away, and I guess they fed you. I only pretended I had mono. I did benefit mm -hmm. from it though. One time, Mike Pitko had mono, and he was out for six weeks. And all the hot girls were in his, in his English class, Mr. Marushak. And it was during my lunch. So I ate my lunch in Mr. Marushak's class because that was a substitute, Mrs. Flaccioni, and I pretended I was Mike Pitko for days. And I would just make fun of the teacher. She goes, what are you doing? I go, I don't know. I'm having fun. She goes, you get a detention. I go, give me five more. And she said, what's your name? I said, Mike Pitko. So I was Mike Pitko. He came back from having mono. He got suspended. Anyway, so I... Okay. <laughs> Did you follow that? That's how, yeah. that's how this podcast goes. We have a lot of fun, Lisa. I hope you like having fun. I hope laughter is a part of your life. Is laughter a big part of your life? What was that? Is laughter a big part of your life? No, I feel it prevents me from moving forward. I think success is very serious, and you shouldn't oh. have fun, and you should be all work and no play. That's great. Then this is your intervention. <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk about that on the show. This is going to be your, no be your intervention today. No laughing. This, this, we, will, we will see to it by the end of this. You're going to tell me to stop. That you, you have a, uh, Your face hurts from Bell's palsy from all the laughing. That's what yeah. that's why. I do believe in the powers of laughter. I have the Laughter Heals Foundation for many years. And what is your relationship to laughter in your life? Did you have it growing up? Did, were you, did you learn to laugh more? Did you laugh through your pain? Uh, tell us some, some about that, Lisa. What an interesting question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that before. Great. Um, no, my family was not into a lot of laughter. I grew up under a Baghdad roof in San Diego, so all the Iraqi rules. So it was just like, be a good kid. Get your straight A's. Go to school. Come home. No play. Work, 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 you know. Go to bed. Yeah. Be a good girl, you know. Well, it's how we're conditioned. But, we're conditioned from that by our parents and teachers, and we yeah. talked about those last episodes. <laughs> It, we have such a condition it goes on, and now our job, I guess, as adults is to recondition and reprogram through programming what you do. You do life coaching, which is great, and a lot of that is what you're doing, right? Yeah, it really affected what I, I do because I had to live a dual life. You know, uh, you have to have create a separate personality because, oh, this is the personality you show, you know, your father. And then this is the personality of who you really are. So you're like two people and it's kind of multiple personality. And yeah. I got fascinated with that. And I started studying that going, oh, some people have 15, 16, you know, I have <laughs> two, you know. <laughs> so, so I think it really started there, the seed of soul blazing, because we all, you know, that's why superheroes are so popular, right? Everyone wants to don their cape and go out and be who they truly are because they want to be seen, they want to be heard, they want to be relevant. And it's just... Their, their truth is locked inside a lot. And I think that's going on in our world today and why LGBTQ is so big now. It's like, finally, we could come out, out because people are saying, why weren't they here like 10 years ago or 15 years ago? Because we weren't still ready for it. And now it's yeah. like, oh, there's an opening and everyone's like bursting out to become their true authentic you, selves. You could say that about a lot of things we were raised. I remember when... Um Oh my God, I'm blanking on his name. He was up for uh, Eagleton. He was up for vice president and he was taken off of the ticket because he actually went to therapy. He saw a psychologist. There was a time, that was another thing. You had to hide anything mental without being in line with everyone else, right? And that's part of what that you said, that that's a new cause. There's constantly causes now that we're seeing that people have been in closets literally and figuratively for a long, long time. And this is what's great about what at your techniques is you bring this out of their authentic self, who they truly were born as. Yes. And what I do is I, well, maybe let me share a story. So this guy came into my office not too long ago and he's from New York. He's Jewish. He's been in therapy since he was like four and he likes to go every week you know, on cue, you know, because he likes that person it was really since he was like 12 or 13 years old. And now he's 34. And he said, I just moved to LA and someone recommended you. 
I said, oh, well, I'm not the type of therapist that you come to every week. I work with you for eight sessions, then you're cured and you're off. If you want someone to hold your hand and just have a go-to person, you know, just to keep, you know, someone who knows your life, you know, to keep that consistency, I could refer you to someone else. Oh, not, so not like, you. Okay. Not for you. For you. I, it's not me. Because I have to travel. I have to, I have other things to do. I'm writing my books. Right. I'm doing yeah. retreats. I, yeah. So I said, but I carve out several months, you know, three months, twice a year to work with people. And that's it. You're done. You know, so I said, the, talk to me, tell me your issue. And he's like, well, uh, I don't know. I'm a casting director and I would like to be a director of documentaries. And I've been trying, but somehow it's not working and I haven't been making the connections. Here's a guy who's good looking. He's charming, you know, articulate, smart. I'm like, why couldn't he like make and create some sort of opportunity to get this. And he was successful in his lane of casting. Yeah. He yeah. wanted to take the casting off and make it just director. He wanted to, yeah, he, he wanted said, to do more, but he was not, he couldn't find the, the courage. Is that what yeah, you define connecting. it as that? He couldn't uh, authentically connect to others. So that's why he was a safe, wanted to be in the safety of a therapist. So I said, okay, he, and he lived in West Hollywood. So I said, you know, stand up. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, just stand up. This is like six minutes in. And I said, turn around. And he turns around. And I said, turn around and tell me you're gay. And he's like, I'm not gay. I go, I know. It's just an exercise. We're playing. <laughs> so he turned around and said, I'm gay. And then I said, okay, turn around. Do it again. Because I'm gay. I said, turn around. He's like, I'm not gay. I, said, I know. It's an exercise. He's like, I'm gay. So he turned around again. And I pretended I was his father. And I invoked, because I have an acting background and improv and all that. So I invoked his, what I thought his father would say. Are you embarrassing to the family? You know, on and on. And then he's like, I, what are you yeah. doing? I said, turn around. Tell me you're gay. And I was his mom. You ruined our relationship. Now we're fighting. Anyway, then he started <laughs> crying. And he said, Lisa, I'm gay. And I went, what so so i said what happened and then he said i said you live in west hollywood he goes i leave west hollywood i drive an hour to go meet somebody or his boyfriend and he's like come back and act like that so he can't have girlfriends and he can't be authentic and it just hurt his whole oh, life unbelievable Good, said, okay. good for you. So, and that, so you were working from an intuitive space. You had, did you have the intuition ahead of time, or was just a, a, it was just an arbitrary no, I, exercise? Oh, you should see what I'm saying about you right now. No. <laughs> you should see what I'm learning about you right now. Go ahead, Go ahead baby. I'm I'm gay. No, I, don't, I, I still don't think I am. You, 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 no, you're maybe not. by the end of this, you'll convince me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's your lane. Maybe, we'll, maybe we'll I'll, have, I'll your lane. have that discovery. Oh, maybe some discovery will happen today. But no, did you? So you did have an intuition that he was gay. A little bit because I was going, "What is the one piece that's missing yeah. in him that is not clicking?" Because we all know how hard it is to be in this town, this business. But someone who already got that far, what stopped him? Where the growth ended? So I told him we have eight sessions. They pay in advance. I said, I'm not seeing you again until you go. He was going on a um, five or six city tour for casting for a uh, game show. So I said, you're going to put a flyer up in the gay bars in all those towns and say, directing a documentary for coming out of the closet. And wow. he ended up doing that. And then I said, the last one's your father in New York, and you're going to tell him you're gay. And anyway, she did this in the next six months and then did a documentary called Dad, I'm Gay. And it was really successful. And he just was, because he could come out of the closet and now he's a documentary That's film so director. Awesome. Good good for you for being, you're a muse for him coming out of, uh, coming out of the closet, being who he truly is, yeah. and, which is everything is about truth, authenticity, being organic and everything else, all the false stuff. That's why they call it Tinseltown. Yeah. Because it's a big tinsel town of Hollywood, which you and I are both a part of. And that, yeah. so do you find being a part of that just really butts up against your true self and your true energy? Do you find that to be like a, a difficult task sometimes? To, you, you don't want to be phony and yet sort of you play the game sometimes. You are phony. Do you run up against that? Um. Well, like for him, I. I asked him how could he go to therapy for almost 20 years without ever telling anyone he said because he was so ashamed so it never came out once in therapy and i think we all do that in our lives i sometimes using what i use soul blazing i put on my impossible 
character mask of whoever I'm with. There, and I say, go. oh, I yeah. need to go on this party. Let me network. Even if I'm in bad mood, I'm cheery. This is who I am Show to network and da-da-da-da-da. Then you go home and go, okay, now let me just, you know, down my whiskey, whatever someone does, you know. And, it, yeah, so you put on a mask. And then you go, oh, wait, I don't want to be that. I want to be authentic wherever I go and be me. So it's a process of slowly peeling away those aspects of you that you're saying, this isn't real. What if someone knew this about me? What if I showed a true side of me? And you start doing it slowly and you realize, wow, I'm having deeper connections now. Yeah. And people aren't reacting the way I thought they would. Is so it, yes, I find myself still doing it, but not as much. And it, it, I like it when I do. You're surrendering. You're sur and I like it when I do. Yeah, you surrender your ego. And I always say ego is evading growth opportunity. When you surrender that ego and what you think you want them to believe about you, what I always say is they already know it. You're not hiding anything, especially, like I said, in Hollywood. You and I are very familiar with Hollywood. I don't know if you know this, but I met you before at your house. house. I know. Oh, you were here. <laughs> I, I was at your house, and I, I hung with you a little bit, but I saw all these all these people that I've known for years. We we All the same circles, but we've never been – I don't believe we've ever been in another room together hanging out. Uh, are, are you? I was a member of the transformational leaders. Are you? Are you? Are you probably? I'm not a member of that. No. Yes. Nor am I anymore, because okay. of, quite frankly, my experience was it's it's a lot about posturing. It's not a lot about helping people, and it sounds like you're dedicated. You're driven to do that. What happened in your life, where you went from? One place, and maybe even imposter syndrome, where you're living this life where you said, I am this, I'm done. I'm, I've hit the bottom. I'm only going to be authentic. I'm going to work on being authentic. What happened to you what, in your life? I was 16 years old, Six and, it started, mm -hmm, and it started with a cake and a gun. I, <laughs> I got <laughs> <laughs> You know, I can't tell you how many people... This is going to be so old. Another cake and a gun story. I've heard every guest on here has a cake and a gun story. Yeah, no, right? It, no, it's unique. It's because I'm just teasing as I do. A cake and a gun. We all want to know where this is going. Um, I, As I mentioned earlier, we had to go to school and come right home. So we're home at 334 because we walk home. And then three houses down, I was baking a cake for our mutual good friend at another of our friend's house. Let's make her a birthday cake for take it to school tomorrow. So I was there and I get, came home and the street lights came, were on and we're not allowed to go out. My dad happened to be home then because normally he's at work till 11 and he started coming back a little early sometimes or come home for an hour and go back. And then as I opened the door, he had a gun pointing at my heart saying, what are you doing? Are you a whore? La, 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 la. The street lights are on. Send her to an orphanage. You know, she's going to pollute the other girls. I have four other sisters. And I just went, oh, my God, my mom's going, calm down. It's nothing. She was doing this. And then I just, Wah! you know, went to my room crying. And at that moment, I thought, wow, he's so afraid of us getting, um, you know, hurt kidnapped, raped. This is when all Charles Manson was out in the 70s mm -hmm. and Hillside yeah. Strangler. So I don't blame him in a way. He had five teenage girls. My mom had five girls by 22. And Ooh, was, boom, 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 boom. In five years, she had five girls. I'm a wow. twin. So yeah, so they, they were nervous. And but my dad was just very strict and protective and very loving. And that's how he showed his love in that moment. Yeah. Uh, didn't feel like it, but that's what it was. Later, now I could go, oh, I'm a mom. I get it. Rah, why are you doing that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to pull a gun on you, but smack, you know, <laughs> but not smack. So, um, yeah, so at that moment, I said, I need to find out what's out there in the world. I, wh what is he so afraid of? So I started sneaking out of my window and hitchhiking and getting in cars with only, like, Hells Angels types. Then if it was a nice person, I'd say, oh, go. If it was Hells Angels type, I'd get in. Like, are you going to rape me? Are you going to kill me? Why do you have a junky car? Why do you have tattoos? Why do you have scraggly hair? Why are you oh, hold on. broke? Time, time out. I just have to be some. I just got to clarify something. You rejected rides when you're hitchhiking from people who look like they had it together. <laughs> that it was wasn't a nice, the point. It, it wasn't was, for the ride. If someone pulled up, a, a, would you like some gray Poupon? Out. So you're, you're looking for... One step from homeless, one step from a crime, 
not uh, not good hygiene. That would probably qualify them to get in. <laughs> Bad teeth, the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't about the ride it was about mm. curiosity of why my father would react so strongly against the bad yeah. people so i wanted to know who i'm supposed to be afraid of my dad told me to fear you why what do you do why are you, do you kill people do you rape people why are you this way well you i'm not well you look you are why if i saw you on the street i my dad would pull me away and say don't hang, hang out with you why did you turn out that way you know what's in your head and, you, and i did and, that and you're there with a little booklet, like writing, are you jotting notes down? Are you have a little recorder with, with you? I mean, it just goes all in your head. This goes, you're just, it's a, it's a, it's a process, process of discovery, which you still do today, which is amazing. And you share it with other people and that's your business and your book and everything that you're about. And you have retreats and all of this, and you're helping a man come out of the closet, all based on these discoveries that you had where your bottom was dad and a cake and a gun yeah and it, it was just it really served me because it made me so curious of life and people because a, a handful of people i got in the car with were the nicest people on the planet nobody hurt me everyone treated me with respect and they became my therapist i would tell them everything because i couldn't tell family or friends yeah. you know every you know your deep thought. I would tell them all my pain and they'd listen. I hear their pain and we'd be talking like for an hour and I'm like, wow, great meeting you, hugs, bye, I gotta get back home and sneak in my window. And it was profound for me. So I found I had an affinity for outlaws, you know, and those type of people. And, iron and ironically, the people you come from are the imposters. They're the real people. That's, that's because they're telling the truth and you're being vulnerable and you're sharing your pain with someone. Because we are in pain. There's so much pain that's out there. And the more we keep it down, it becomes like a, a boiling pot. And I think that's what's going on in America or in the world so much. There's so much that we're just not willing to investigate or reveal or, or reach down any deeper than our anger and our rage. And our, you know, we're reflecting back this, this pain and darkness to other people. And yeah. It, it, it's it's very it's almost mythological like Star Wars. We've got this this dark side and we give in to it as opposed to looking to the light which you did. You searched for the light in these people that were considered and labeled dark. Yeah. And you became a healer that day or those days, right? And you became a healer and then that became yeah. your destiny. And it you you literally have been doing it since then have you or did you take detours and you must have like joined a commune or something. So, <laughs> there's, no, there's no way. Well, you you joined a commune of being married with children. So, that's, that's to a certain, not so much. I, very late in life, I got married at forty because uh -huh. I didn't want to get married. I was the guy in relationships. I said, I just want to date. If you want marriage and kids, I'm not your girl. <laughs> you know? Wow, go really? out, have a good time, uh -huh. and until it lasts, then it lasts till it lasts. So I've had three strong relationships like that who are my best friends today. They're like my brothers because yeah. we shared so much, but it was, you know, we knew it was, you know, we traveled together, we did all sorts of stuff. But what it did was it then finally, like uh, it made me in my thirties go to Iraq. I'm going, I want to understand my culture more. You know, I did acting, I did commercials. I modeled in Tokyo, raised a million dollars, directed and uh, wrote a movie, sold two screenplays, you know, all this along the way. Then I said, okay, now what? And I thought, let me go to Iraq and find my roots. Because even though I have all this success, I still have pain and a hole in me somewhere that's saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. I'm a fake. I'm a phony. And I'm just pretending to have these skills, but I really don't. I'm just a good promoter or whatever. So I go, I got to kill that. And of course, my dad said, if you go, I'll disown you. It's dangerous. So when W was bombing, it was during Desert Storm, I was sitting mm. on the couch and I saw Christian Anapur on the news she was talking about how there's a no-fly zone now in iraq and that you have to take an 18-hour bus ride from jordan to iraq to get to the el rashid hotel and that it stops five times and that they're kidnapping americans for ransom and i went bingo i could be christian anapur and be a war reporter that's just like acting and fun adrenaline so i need to get to jordan go on that bus since i'm besties with outlaws i could get kidnapped bond with the terrorists you know we could have our therapy <laughs> sessions and we could write a book from terrorist to humanitarian be on cnn and then i'll be a war reporter great 
So uh, this, I, the, 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 this was the concept, and all of us are curious. <laughs> did you did you actually execute this concept? I I know you did it when you were sixteen. Did you do this in 1991 and you're jumping in cars and hitchhiking with uh, people that are on their way to commit terrorism? Is that the... Uh, no, I, what, what we're I got a here? fake Louis Vuitton bag. I got cubic zirconia stones and I booked my ticket to Iraq. So I was in Jordan and then I was, you know, waiting. And then I saw this woman sitting there and she looked like she was by herself. So I went up to talk to her and said, you know, who are you with? What are you doing? She goes, oh, I'm by myself. I go, you're going to Jordan? She goes, no, Iraq. I go, are you nuts? You're going by yourself? And she was around my same age. She said, yeah. I said, why? She said, I'm going there to kill myself. I heard about the terrorists. I said, why are you want to kill yourself? She was like 34. She said she was the youngest child of a huge family, you know, nine, 12. She was the prize of the family that they made her be a lawyer and made her do this and that. And in reality, she was a completely different person. You have to marry a Chaldean or an Arab. You have to do this and that. And what she wanted to do was a lot of other things. And she wasn't allowed to. So instead of shaming her family or leaving the family, she thought she'd go to Iraq, find her roots, but get killed in the process or she dies a martyr. And I thought, oh my God, instead of doing that, join me, we get kidnapped. We write a book together and let's start a business together and do this thing for empowerment of women. And she's like, oh, I can do that. So, okay, high five. And we got on the bus. <laughs> and then uh, we can do done. that. And I get to stay alive. This is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you come yeah, from? Like, you, were like a, you were like a gift to her. You were, and I guess you could call an angel the light, was, which was dimmed to the point of darkness and wanting to die, was brought out in her that human potential that we all have. You became her muse. Yes, because now her family would agree to writing a book, working with the Middle East, working, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was like a, a hope, a chance. So we get to the Al Rashid Hotel. No, every time they come on the bus, I'd say, oh, oh, my God, I dropped all my diamonds. And, you know, nobody there has money, so they want their rich relatives to come in, you know, give them money. And then I'm like, rich relative, pick me, pick me, you know. Nobody would ask, assalamu alaikum. Oh, like him so long. <laughs> the next time we got four more chances and we get more outrageous each time and nobody would do it. Then we go to the El Rashid Hotel and then where's the worst area to go? Where's the worst crime to stay away from? Taxi, you know, go there. Nobody, nobody, nobody. Um, super nice people. <laughs> I'm like, dang. So we started going all over the country. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You, you couldn't find you needed your casting director to find you somebody somebody nasty is that what you're saying you couldn't find anyone who's cruel and and a bad person is that what you're saying it was like a, i didn't a, want them to be cruel i wanted maybe a bad person to kidnap me but then be nice to me because he knows that we're connected we're soul we're soulmates well listen or this is what happens when we watch the news why well, i don't watch the news by the way because they do the casting call of who your enemy is I remember when the debates years ago, they said, you must say Islamic fundamentalist terrorists. And then, well, where'd they go? You know what I mean? It's just, it goes to show you how we we just see people in a certain way. Yeah. But all of those people are human. They're all covering up their pain. Yeah. They're all yeah. suffering. And they don't know how to deal with it because the skills aren't there. And then you come along, this available person who's working on intuition and you're offering this to them. You're offering love. And, and it turns out one of them became, she, she became your partner. And we were together for like 12 years, traveled all over together. And then she died of cancer a few oh, years ago. Oh, wow. But yeah. what a story though. That's amazing. That's an amazing yeah, but, story. Yeah. Yeah, Wait, but, there's more. Yeah. So we went there and then we went to Tilkaf, which is the small Christian town where our families lived in caves. So we went to her family's house and we knocked on the door. Can we go in? This is where I was born and all that kind of stuff. And then um, in that little town, all they had was like a school, a hospital and an orphanage. And I'm like, oh, orphanage, this is where my dad was going to send me when I was 16. You know, because that was where he grew up. So we went in there and I started interviewing the kids. Who are you? We don't like us. Why is everyone bombing us? My father died, my uncle lost his leg, this and that happened. I'm like, oh, I, I care, I care, it's politics, and I'll memorialize your words, or like how, I'm like, I don't know, because I'm a nobody, I don't know anything about anything at that point. I'm still just, you know, winging life, and 
and then I decide to go. So anyway, I spent the next five years going to 15 orphanages, living there, interviewing kids, doing all that stuff, and wrote a book called Whispers from Children's Hearts, which is somewhere. Uh, that, um, what, what, what's interesting to me is um, I want to know where you got – I think anyone would agree with me. These are very, really courageous acts that you're doing. They're certainly not normal. You're not coached or taught this. There's some inspiration inside of you. What do you attribute that to? What do you call it, that inspiration, that that voice, that uh, something inside of you is driving you to make decisions like this that are, and of course, you could use the word abnormal. It's, you're not in line with anyone else. My One of my books is called Get Out of Line and Into Alignment. Mm. There's some alignment that you've had in your life that is ethereal, it's divine, it's magnificent, it's big, it's broad, it's powerful, and it's more powerful than fear. Tell us how you do that. Tell us what that voice is called, what, what you did. and it is a calling that you've had. You've had several callings in your life. What do you attribute it to? And give, you give us a pointer, if you will, or just share your experience in that. Well, I think the main thing is when you, I think, I, think mm, I know exactly what it is, when you feel tremendous love from your family and your community, and then that gets um, tainted, you know, like with what happened when I was 16, and then your whole world is shattered and something in you stops trusting people or starts, um, wanting to know the truth. Why are we even here? What what makes people do the things they do? How could someone who loves you do that? And it just, then it, this is really sad. So don't feel sorry for me. <laughs> oh, is, oh no, no, I, I never, I never do. I, I look at everything as an opportunity for growth and yeah. transformation. Anything bad that happens to any of us, a lot of us have been through it. And that's what we're here for. I believe that's what our gift is to share those things. So keep going. I mean, there's no apology yeah. necessary we don't think you're nuts. Yeah, I think you're brave. That, yeah, it's a part of me that feels like I don't matter. And if I die tomorrow, who cares? Yeah. And if I die for a cause, then my life meant something. So I put myself in these situations because I don't care if I die. And mm -hmm. sometimes the pain is so strong. Um, even though I lead a great life, I'm happy. I've got everything anyone could want. And all, you know, like your little pie, all my areas are full. But still, there's that seed of that little girl who's saying, oh, you don't matter. So I think that drives me. But once I had a child, I adopted a child after all of the orphanage thing. Um, after she came into my life, I can't do those things anymore because now I have to be there for her if I die. Yeah, I, I know so everything my, changes once the kids come. Yeah. 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 I, I, I don't bungee jump anymore. I just look at the photos of me jumping out of a balloon and go, what is wrong with you? <laughs> it's like, yes. like it's, 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 all those adventure things, they're all in the gone. past now. No interest. Gone. And I, I'm also not interested in my kids doing it either. So, but yeah. we're powerless over their journey, though. I mean, that's the thing is we can only do so much. That's what I'm finding. Yeah, but it's exciting adventure. And after all that happened, you know, I went to my dad and I said, thank you. By you doing that one incident, then we became so close because I took pictures of his home, went to his school, his high school, and, and all those friends that are still there and had him say hi to my dad. And it was the best gift in the world for him. And we became so close the last 15 years. We were close the whole time, but very close at the last 10 years of his life. And I said, you gave me the best gift by doing that. I said, but let me ask you, would you do it again? now like 25 years later is that would that be a choice of who you've grown to be and he said i would I'm oh like, wow that's a surprise what? i didn't see that coming that's <laughs> I, mean, I didn't either and i said do you care if i share that story with people i said because that's really profound it changed my life yeah. and it's wrong dad and he said no i don't care because i would do it yeah. again yeah well but, look at what but, it did so i guess he's looking at yeah. it like that it manifested a change and it and something very profound in you that you now get to share your gift and your knowledge and your experience and your hope. You get to bring yep. that to other people now. Uh, you know what I love? I'm just going to it's, it's acknowledge what I love about you. I don't know you well, but I am an intuitive. And um, the last guest, unbelievable what, what took place on that one. I mean, the, the, just these intuitive, these inspirations come up in me, these psychic hits. What I really enjoy about you is – 
like we all have our resumes. We all have our books and you're a bestseller. We have, you know, you have a retreat coming up with Russell Simmons. We're going to get to that. We all have that. These are accolades. These are things that like prove to the world and things like that. What I dig about you is you're willing to share your experiences, not your opinions and not your thoughts. I mean, obviously that's there as well. And you're brilliant. I can tell that as well. You're very, very, very smart. But it goes so much deeper than that. If it's a mind, body, and spirit, scarecrow, tin man, and lion from the Wizard of Oz, you're all three. And I think that's a wonderful place to be. You have the trifecta down. And I, I do appreciate you giving us these stories because it puts us there in a place where we're going, what would I do? What would I do? Well, I can assure you I'm not getting in that car. <laughs> no, I shouldn't even say that. I've been a lot. Of, I used to hitchhike. People don't even know what the term means anymore. Right? <laughs> I mean, a hitchhike, what does that mean? I don't even want to tell my kids what it means because that's how you got around. I mean, I, I hitchhiked and, and, and we, God, the things, can you believe the things that we went through though? That, no. Like, the, you, it's always, that, that would never happen today. It's true. It would never happen today. Even the silly thing, my, my, my mom had a Volkswagen Beetle and she was very poor and to save money at the drive-in, she would put me in the trunk of the Beetle and when she pull up, you pay by the head, and I'd be in the trunk for like five miles short of the theater. Right. I'm, driving, I'm talking to them through the radio speaker. <laughs> Are we there yet? And I hear and the guy goes, how many? She goes, there's me, my daughter. I said, how about your son in the trunk? <laughs> so, oh, my God. All those, all those things make for hilarity because they're the truth. Yeah. And it's like it, I think that we're too careful today. And I want to just – that's the biggest thing I want to really bear down on with you is that, that I'm picking up is the courage. That's the word. If I was to define this episode, it's about courage. That you have the courage, and I do want to keep drilling down on you, though. I want to know what you're calling that voice, that inspiration, whatever it is. I want you to tell us and share what that is. It sounds like you've gotten positions where you're going, I had no other choice, or whatever it was. Well, you do have other choices. So I want to know what it is that compels you. What, what does drive you? Some people are drive, driven by humiliation. Some people want to prove something. What is it that brings that out in you? They would get in that car, go to that orphanage, pair up with that woman, risk your life. What, what is it inside of you? I think I just, uh, I value truth and authenticity so much that I feel I want to put myself in situations where you, it's like split second decisions and you have to be on your toes and you get to understand other people and people that you would normally never meet or be around, um, that you go, oh, those are them, this is us. Uh, I worked in prisons in Chowchillan, worked with inmates, and I did the same thing with them. And I really connected with the bully in the prison for the same reason, nobody could deal with her and she hurt everybody. She's been in there for 23 years and she was just really dark, she had shaved head, 6'2", with a, a snake tattoo coiled around her head and went down her arms and she's like who do you think you are you honky you know i hate your briefcase too and you think you can help me we're from different worlds and i'm like i hate my briefcase too i brought it to impress you okay <laughs> <laughs> cancel that i said there's nothing in it anyway <laughs> just like power you know power play you know and i said this is what your problem is and i just got up to her i put our chairs just like this and i said this is your problem and i just slammed into her and she just woke up and so it's mirroring, soul blazing is mirroring the energy of the other person so they could hear you and respect you at their level. And once she saw I wasn't afraid to confront her and like get in her face, she went, whoa, you're different from the other people. And, you know, she, I saw I ended up giving her gratitude stuff to do this and that. Mm -hmm. And within six months, she went to the pay phone and was, she raised $75,000 for battered women. And she became the angel of the prison. Then the people there were calling me saying, what did you do to her? I said, I blazed her soul. Because at the end of our session, she's crying. And she said, uh, I said, how do you feel now? She goes, you blazed my soul. And I said, how did I do that? She said, nobody else 23 years could do this. And it's because I didn't sit there and ask the questions and right. be clinical. I'm like, come on, talk to me. No, you you got dirt. We're the same. Let's find that. And But now, 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 now this is why my, 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 everybody that works for me makes fun of me, that I don't let, the, I don't let people off the hook. I'm going to keep you on the hook. I want to know. What when you're saying that to her, when you're inspired, that's what I'm want, trying to unpack. I want you to share with us what that voice is called. Is it God? Is it spirit? Is it 
What is it that compels you, that drives you? I want it. I want to. I want to like a a label for it or something that you can give us. That you know, these stories are magnificent stories of transformation for other people and the gift that you share. Something in there. There's something in there that says I want to tell the truth because a lot of people want to tell lies. Yeah. What is it? What is it that keeps you in that truth space? What is it that keeps you in that space of healing and gifting other people? It's 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 called something. It's got to be. I'm sure you you've lived your life. It's defined as something. Can you get share that with us? I I think it's just again when you go through so much or a big trauma, you. I, you, you want to cut the bullshit, you know, it's just like, I don't want to live my life pretending anymore. And I don't want to be like those people who have it all together and I'm perfect and I'd rather be messy. And I think um, that transformation I felt, especially like in the orphanage, I just like, wow, this could have been me. This was my life. You, I, I think something just changes in you. And I think to give that to other people is so powerful to say, look, you know, you are not who you think you are. That's yeah. an imposter. And we, I discovered seven masks from interviewing like a thousand people. There's a lot more, but I, but I cut them down. What, but what makes you say that to them? What is it? Is it your mind, your heart, your intuition? Spirit? No, intuition. I cannot. That's, that's, I can't that's what I'm, it. that's what I'm getting at. It's intuitive. Yeah. It's heart it's, to heart. I hold their hands. It's, 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 but it, but but hold on, we're, we're still. You got to keep coming from. It's coming from somewhere. It has to have a source energy to make you do those things that manifest in those great examples of transformation and things like that. I'm like you're with yourself. You're going, oh man. There's a voice inside of you. It's speaking to you. Do you define what that voice is called? Do you do you call it something? Or is it, it? What is it? What is it that that makes you? You're different than most people. And what is it that does that to you? Is it contemplation, contemplation, introspection, prayer, meditation, um, just self thought, looking in the mirror, uh, whatever it is? I meditate every morning and every night, usually at sunrise and sunset. Mm -hmm. And I commune with nature. I walk barefoot. I talk to ants. I hug trees. I talk to rocks. Um, had a huge conversation with a rock in Nepal at a retreat. I was going to walk away because it wasn't answering back. All of a sudden, it started talking back. So I went back and listened to the wisdom of the rock. <laughs> and I, I do that all in over the world. In, ho in Hollywood, it would be Dwayne Johnson. But this is an actual, right, there you this go. Is an actual <laughs> rock. Dwayne that, for president. <laughs> this is an actual rock that is not talking back to you. But indeed, it was. Yeah. Indeed, indeed it, it was talking back to you. That, I am that I am. You know, there's, there's that, I, yeah. I am that, I, it's, I am that yeah. comma, I am, I am that rock. And it's a reflection back if we are present enough, but it's that presence. And there's something that happens when you're in that presence. We're not distracted, mm -hmm. not doing, not having to do, you know, do, 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 do. There is those moments. And I'm happy to hear you meditate, you contemplate, you, you get out with nature, you have nature respond back to you. And those are the voices that I'm talking about because I have this show so we can all get tips. We all get tips on how to do things, and that's what your retreat is about. So your retreat, let's take us to the retreat. It's with Russell Simmons, and um, it's in Bali. Yeah, and GDOS is Russell Simmons New Wellness Center, and it's going to be finished in March. Now the rooms are finished in the wellness center part. It's extraordinary. It has anything and everything, including a medical doctor, you know, the cryo, the, the everything you can imagine. Flotation tanks and workout gyms and three pools, infrared saunas, regular sauna, everything. Gorgeous. And I was there in March and I gave a couple of my books. A friend of mine, Ben Vereen, who was there and we've been buddies for like 30 years. And he said, come, come. I'm like, I don't have time. He's come. So I went there and I brought my books and I just gave them to the bookshop and whatever and said, oh, sell my books while you're here. And they started reading them. And then they called me and said, can we meet with you? And they said, well, you be our, our inaugural retreat leader. We love your book. And da, 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 da. Love it. So, oh, wow. So that's how that happened. And like taking a retreat like that. And even if I'm not on a retreat or a workshop, and you got to remember, I've done about 20 retreats twice in Tanzania and Costa Rica and Singapore and Bali a couple of times before everywhere i've done retreats leading people and in my retreats i have them 
you know, you get up, meditate, yoga, eat, and then a little lecture on something, a theme of the day. And then what I did was, especially in Tanzania and Kenya and these places, you bring a suitcase of stuff, your Oprah, and you just knock on someone's door. And then you go, we're here, and there's like 12 of us. Then we give them all this medicine, toys, clothes, think wherever city people are yeah. from, like I'm Hollywood, so Hollywood t-shirts and pens and pencils and stuff. And then we say, what do you need? And then we hire local carpenters to build. Oh, we need bunk beds. We need a floor. We need goats. We need chickens, whatever it is they need. We need a fence around this. And we build it all within a few days. And then we leave. Goodbye. And they're like, oh, my God, what just well, you, happened? Well, you have an imp we, impact and you're leaving an imprint on people. For, for Yeah. What that does, you go back at night, then we soul blaze, and I put make it pitch dark, and I put candles out, and then we talk, so you're more free to talk when people aren't just looking at you. And when you do something nice for someone else, when you volunteer, you like yourself more. And when you like yourself more, there's an opening to heal yourself. You don't have to be an asshole or a motherfucker when someone does something, or oh, lose your temper and start, especially out with your employees. A lot of people are super nice, and yeah. especially celebrities, but to their staff, they're not so nice, or they you know, act out, or they snap. And it's because they're not in alignment necessarily with their true calling. What they're in alignment in is, I'm powerful. You're not. Fuck off if you screw up. You know, your your screw up is my reputation. Yeah. And there's some truth to that, but it's also oh, there's another way, or there's a in people's life in marriage. You pick on your spouse. You know, you know the husband picks on the wife. The wife picks on the kids. The kid picks on the dog. You know the that whole yeah. thing. I would I would argue that it, it, it it's all about you. It's not a little bit. It's not a part of it. It's all about you. What you're, what you're manifesting. Yeah. Hey, what's going on over there? Get over here! No, I was just, I was just acting like a Hollywood <laughs> asshole. <laughs> and it happened. Yeah, I just, I just got into a car accident a couple of days ago. We collide. I don't know whose fault it is. All of a sudden, someone is there, and we collide. And then she's like, "Oh my god, my car!" Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, "Shh, calm down." And she's like, "What?" She's like, "I think it was your fault." I said, "It doesn't matter whose fault it was. It wasn't a huge accident." But I said, "It doesn't matter." It's karma. We met for a reason. Let's go have lunch because why would we meet on the freeway like this when we're both busy? I said, let's exchange numbers and go have lunch and discuss it. And the universe will figure this out and it's going to be nothing. She's like, okay, you're weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, well, hey, what? Guess what? You are. <laughs> you are in a great way. You're, it's not normal to behave like this. And I wish it were more so. I wish the world would have a perspective like this. I, we're out of time. I'm so happy to hang with you. I want to go to Bali. I'm going to go. Oh, come. Um, it'll be so much fun. Maybe I could do my guided laffitation. You really got to check that out. If you, you, think, you can think, do it. If you think yes. meditation is, is significant, and you, uh, try an energy shift with laffitation. Just, I'll just do a real quick one right now. Just laugh with me. <laughs> 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 Ah, you're out of your mind. Ah. You get in cars with strangers. Ah. You're motivated by a gun and a cake. There you go. I guarantee I do this with my coaching. As they tell me what your level of stress is, and then afterwards it always goes down when you laugh. So yeah. cool. And by the way, I love you for doing that. So we got to go yeah. hang in real life. We got a lot of mutual friends, that. and none of them yeah. will be there. It'll just be you and me. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa Haysha. I always act like I'm on radio or the television show or something. We have Lisa Haysha was our guest today. And we, <laughs> so go get her book, Releasing Wellness Journal on Amazon this Friday. Absolutely. Go see that. And uh, go check her out, okay? You, you see her information here and all that. So great time with you. Uh, fabulous. I can't wait to go hang with you again. And uh, when we have a bite or something, you know what we should do? What? We should go and hang out together and both of us try to outdo each other in saving people. No, I'm just kidding. I'm out of the rescue business. I'm done. I'm done. I just got divorced. Another rescue. Done. I just got divorced. Yeah. You did, you did not. I did not. Oh my, my God. Well, a year ago. Let, let me tell you yeah. something. The, the, the dating world is not good out there, okay? So protect yourself. I say this yeah. to everybody. 
uh, the dating apps, there's a lot of frauds out there, okay? So, so go protect yourself. All right, well, we'll go hang, okay? And uh, thank you, Lisa, for joining us. This is called Still Standing Up with Craig Shoemaker. Yes, a comedian who also has some, uh, some experience to share about transformation, my own and all the guests. And we had such a great guest today. So that's it, Gianni. I'm going to go yell at Gianni for not getting the, the battery's low. The battery, look at that. The battery's low. Look at <laughs> Bye. I can't wait to laugh with you. Sounds good. See you later. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Thank you. Okay. See ya. Hey, it's Craig Shoemaker. I wanted to give you a special offer. I don't like saying it like that, but I will because it's actually called Special Offers on my website. Now, I don't know if you know this, but I've been in the coaching business for a little while. Now, we have something called Winning with Laughter. We have Winning with Humor. Now, we have Winning with Laughter. I'll teach you how to win in life with laughter. Now, it's available in a special offer. You don't have to be part of the course. You can join now. You're already too late on the other one. Now, you can have this. Go to Special Offers on the website, craigshoemaker.com, and you're going to learn how to win with laughter and even you can be funnier I can teach you